Hi everyone, today we're going to be finishing off this mini project by adding in a game over screen. Before we get to that though, let's just make sure so that these falling blocks uh, destroy themselves once they sort of fall off the bottom of the screen. So if we go into the spawner class, you can see that we've figured out that half the screen height in world units is simply the main camera's orthographic size. So if we copy that and go into the falling blocks uh, class, we can create a float variable called something like the visible height threshold. So that visible height threshold will be equal to negative half the screen height minus the block's own size, which is just transform.localScale.y. Then in the update method, we can just do a check to see if the block's position has fallen below that visible height threshold. So if transform dot position on the y-axis is less than the visible height threshold, then we we'll want to destroy the falling block. So we can simply say destroy game object. So if we save that now and play, we should see that as this falls off the screen, the object gets destroyed. All right, so now for the game over screen, Let's go to the game object menu and add a canvas as well as a text element. And if we just zoom out a bit, we can drag this text element up somewhere near the top of our canvas. And let's just center align this text and change it to read something like game over. And we can also increase the font size. You'll see once it becomes too big for the bounding box, it just disappears. So let's resize the bounding box. Now, you'll see that if we change the size of the screen, the size of the UI doesn't change with it, which is a little bit frustrating. So what we can do is go into the canvas, and instead of having it set to a constant pixel size, we can tell it to scale with the screen size. So now if we just resize this once again, get it how we want it, let's say something like that, and maybe make this a nice bright white. Now if we change the size of the screen, you can see it scales along with it. Uh, we might also want a custom font. So let's go into our materials folder and just drag something in. I'll use something called mockup and just drag that into the font slot over there. Let's now go into our text object and let's rename this heading. And then if we just duplicate that with command D, we can drag it down and let's make this a little bit smaller and have this read something like uh, press space to play again. All right, it's gonna need to be even smaller than that. And maybe make this a bit darker so it's not stealing attention away from the heading. And we can just call this our play again instruction. And then let's duplicate this drag it down here. We're going to want to display the number of seconds that the player survived for. So let's say uh, seconds survived colon and then make another text element which is just going to display the number of seconds um, but in very large text. So I'm going to make this bounding box nice and big and scale this up to be quite enormous. Let's see how well this fits on say with three characters, that looks good, I'll maybe make it a tiny bit smaller. And uh, we can change this color to maybe a nice red. All right, something like that looks pretty good. We'll probably want to make this second survived uh, heading a little bit brighter, maybe like that. Let's just rename these things, so I'll call this the seconds survived heading. And this just simply second survived. All right, so if we just quickly enter play mode, I quite like it that once the game ends, the blocks continue falling in the background. It just adds some sort of visual interest to the game over screen. But with them as bright as they are, it can be a little bit distracting. So what we might do is add a transparent background to our game over screen. So let's just go up here and add a image element. And if we just resize this to fill the screen, currently it's rendering on top of everything else, 
and we can just change that by moving it up in the hierarchy. And then let's make this entirely black and just tone down the opacity a little bit. So if we play now, we can still see the falling blocks, but it's not as distracting. Uh, let's also put all of these elements under a single object so that we can easily enable and disable them. So let's just create a empty child of the canvas and call this our game over screen. And we can just grab all of these and parent them to the game over screen object. We're going to need to create a game over script and that script is going to have three tasks. First of all, when the player dies, it's going to enable the little game over screen that we created. And secondly, it's going to set the second survived to the correct value. Finally, it's going to see if the spacebar is pressed down. And if it is, then it's going to reload the scene so that the game can be played once again. So let's head over to our scripts folder and let's create a new c -sharp script. I'm going to call this game over. All right, and let's just create a little empty game object somewhere in our scene, call this the game over manager, and add the game over script to that. If we just open this up, in order to achieve the first task, we're going to need a reference to our game over screen object. So let's just create a little public game object, call this game over screen. All right, and then we're going to need to know when the game is over. So let's create a method called on game over. And when that method is called, we'll simply say game over screen dot set active true. So that will enable the object. Then to set the number of seconds survived to the correct value, we're going to need to get a reference to that text object. And in order to get access to the UI text, we're going to have to use the namespace unity engine dot UI. This will allow us to create a public text variable. We can call this our seconds survived UI. And then on game over, we'll say second survived UI dot text. And we'll just want to set that to the amount of time that has passed. So time dot time. Now, this needs to be set to a string, and time.time .time is, of course, a float value. So in order to convert it to a string, we can just say dot to string. All right, now if we save and go into Unity, we'll see these two slots have appeared over here. So let's just go and drag the game over screen onto our game over screen field and the second survive text into our second survive UI. Let's also then make the game over screen be disabled by default. All right. Then to achieve the third task, let's have a bool to say whether or not the game is currently over. So when the on game over method is called, we'll say game over is now true. And then in the update method, we can say if the game is over, then we're going to be watching out for the space key to be pressed down. And if that's pressed down, we're going to want to reload the scene. Now, in order to reload the scene, we're going to need access to the scene manager. So once again, we need to add a new namespace up here using unity engine dot scene management. This allows us to say scene manager dot load scene and we can load it either with its name or with its index. So we'll just want to load the first scene, so with an index of zero. So let's save that. And in order to be able to load the scene, we're going to need to go up to File, Build Settings, and here we've got the scenes active in our build, and we can just go into our Scenes folder and drag the current scene there. And you can see it's got index zero, so that's the one that will be loaded. Now, this is all going to work fantastically, but currently the on game over method isn't called from anywhere. Now, the easiest way to resolve this would be to simply make the method public and then head over to the player script. And just before we destroy the player object, we could do a little find object of type search for an object of type 
game over and just call the on game over method on that. Now this would work. We can go into Unity, press play, and if we get ourselves destroyed by a block, then the game over screen appears. But as I spoke about in episode 12 on script communication, this isn't a very good practice because the player script doesn't really have any relationship to the game over script, so it's strange having a reference to it over here. The solution I proposed in episode 12 is to use an event. So if you remember how to do this, we can just come up here, create a public event, system.action, and we can call this something like on player death. And then before we destroy the game object, we can say if the on player death event is not null, then we're going to invoke it by saying on player death followed by a pair of parentheses, just like a regular method call. Now over in the game over class, the on game over method no longer needs to be public. And in the start method, we're going to want to get a reference to the player controller. So we can say find object of type player controller, and we'll say on player death plus equals on game over. If you don't remember this notation, I recommend you have another look at episode 12, but this is simply subscribing the on game over method to the on player death event. So if we now save, head back to Unity, you can see that this will work very nicely. I would just like to round the number of seconds survived to the nearest integer. So let's head over to the game over method and just use mathf dot round to int on time dot time and then convert that to a string. There is one more problem. If I just survive for a little bit and now get myself killed, that was six seconds. If I play again and just die immediately, you can see it's nine seconds. So it's clear that time dot time is not resetting when we reload the scene. So instead what we want to use is time dot time since level load. And for the same reason, we'll want to go onto the difficulty class and we'll want to use time dot time since level load here as well so that the difficulty actually resets instead of continuing where it was when you play again. So with that, this little project is actually complete. I'm going to quickly ramp up the difficulty though, because it's a little bit boring in the opening stages. So maybe make the maximum spawn time about 0.6. And then if we go on to the falling block prefab, can make the minimum speed maybe 10.5 and the maximum speed 13.5. All right, let's quickly work on exporting our game. So if we go up to File, Build Settings, you can see that it's currently set to a Mac standalone build, which is exactly what I want. Let's go to Player Settings for some more uh, options. Now, one thing we need to be aware of is that since we're exporting at this funny aspect ratio, 3 by 5, we're not going to be able to allow the game to be played in full screen without uh, doing some more advanced stuff, which I don't want to get into at the moment. So uh, let's just disable the full screen switch. And let's also disable both the is native resolution and the default is full screen. So now we can enter our own default screen width and height. So uh, we'll make that comply with the aspect ratio, something like 600 by 1000 perhaps. So if we just build this now, uh, we'll see that it pops up with this, uh, it's called the resolution dialog box. And our resolution isn't anywhere there. So if we press play now, it's not going to be playing in the correct resolution. So if we delete that, Let's go back to the player settings and let's just make sure that the resolution dialog is disabled. And uh, let's just change our product name over here. I'll call mine falling blocks. And then we can build. And when that's done, we should open this up and you can see it's in the correct resolution and we can 
play our game. So, didn't survive very long there. Let me have one more go at it. The difficulty seems fairly good to start off with. Um, just need to remember to use the screen wrap thing to my advantage. All right, I won't bore you with endless hours of me playing, but um, this seems to be working very nicely. So, I hope you enjoyed, and until next time, cheers!